everyone, how's it going? We're going to learn about convolutional neural networks today, or CNNs as they're called, or ConfNets. So previously we've been looking at models that look like this, where we have layer after layer of these dense neural networks. And by dense we meant that everything in one layer was connected to everything in the next layer. And so what this meant was, in our previous example, we had this image, a 28 by 28 image, that's 784 pixels, and each of those pixels was connected to each node of the next layer, those 512 nodes. So each pixel was connected to each of those 512 nodes. That's densely connected, or a dense layer. Here's what a convolution model will look like. And we're not going to dwell on each line just now, but we'll look at that first line of interest, which is that we're adding a layer that's a convolutional, two-dimensional convolution. And I'll explain those numbers in just a second. And what that 3x3 three three means in that layer means we're going to be looking at only a 3x3 three three patch or window of that full picture. We're not going to look at the whole picture. We're just going to look at a small part of the picture, that 3x3. Three three. So let's take as an example that picture of a digit, the 28 by 28 picture. And our previous densely connected idea was like this, where remember each of those pixels was connected to each node of the next layer. That's not how it's going to work in the 3x3 three three case. In 3x3, three three, we're looking at a window of that picture. So we see that blue square there representing where we're looking at in the picture. And we're just going to move that square along. And as it goes, and when it reaches the end of a row, it's just going to move down to the next row. So we're only looking at a very small window of that picture. And now you may be thinking, hey, this is really kind of screwy. Shouldn't we be looking at the entire picture and not just a 3x3 three three part of it? Well, here's the reasoning of why we would do that. So here we have two images, let's say. They're small 5x5 five five images. And to a fully connected network, a dense network, these look different, right? The first row there is all light blue. In the second image, the first row has a couple dark blue or darker blue pixels to them. So they look different. We'd have to learn these things kind of separately. But to a 3x3 three three patch or window, as we move along those windows, at some point, they look the same. We have this kind of Tetris reverse L shape or whatever. Right? So at some point, we're learning similar things. We're seeing similar things in both these images. And as we move further along, we'll see the same things true with that other part of the image. So here, we're finding similarities. We, the learning can build regardless of kind of where it is in the image. And a better example of this we might be looking at, let's say we're trying to learn dogs and cats. We're trying to distinguish between dogs and cats or dogs and everything else. So one part of this might be, let's detect, have an eye detector just to find where the eyes are. And I've kind of faked it by doing these little ovals. So that's one picture we're processing. We're again trying to train a network and looking at all these pictures to find dogs or to learn about dogs. And here we have another, and that's where the eyes are in that picture. And here we have another picture, and we get the eyes there. So you see, the, here's where all the eyes were. They're in very different positions. And again, if they were fully connected, each of those looks separate. They look different, right? They're all in different places. If we're moving a small window along, all of a sudden we see the similarities of, hey, these are eyes. So regardless of where eyes are in the picture, it's going to say, these are eyes. There's a potential for eyes there. So that's kind of the advantage of this 3x3, three three, looking at a small window rather than looking at the entire picture. So this is how it works. So we, on the very bottom, we have a picture. In this case, it's a cat. And the first 3x3 three three pass through it, the first convolutional layer, it's going to detect kind of hyper-local features like edge detectors, things along those lines of just very kind of small ideas. And the next layer up, another convolutional layer, it's going to detect local features. So it can put these edges together and say these edges form an eye or these edges form a nose or an ear. And eventually we're going to combine those features, the eye, nose, ear features, and say, hey, this is a cat. It has these features. That's the idea of convolutional neural networks. And here's one thing I did where I just took a picture of a dog 
and I'm just feeding it through that convolution. And you can see it does a pretty good job. This is the first layer. It does a pretty good job of detecting edges. The idea is that it detects local patterns. So you can see in that little image that I have the kind of a bottom of a line there, and it can find it regardless of where it is in the image or just a kind of a diagonal line it can detect. So regardless of where things are, it can detect them. So that's sort of the advantage, that the patterns they learn are kind of translational invariant. If you learn a pattern in one location, like if you learn, hey, these are eyes in you know, the top right of a picture, then you know, when you see them occur somewhere else in the middle of a picture or the lower part of the picture, you can still recognize them as eyes. And that's how the real world works, right? So if I have a cup on my desk and you can see that it's a cup, and if I move that cup a couple feet in one direction, you can still recognize that it's a cup. It doesn't matter where it is in your field of vision, you can recognize the object. So it's kind of mirroring how things really work. And the other characteristic is that you can combine these little features or hyper features like edge detection and form the next level up in features like eyes, nose, and ears. So these hyperlocal edges combine to form local objects and those local objects then can form eventually something like a cat or a dog. And these CNNs are widely used. So in the first example I'm giving you is image classification. Can we tell the difference between a dog and a cat or the number four versus the number three? But they're also used in object localization and detection. So the task here is that instead of looking at a picture and saying that's a picture of a dog, just to find the different objects in a picture. And you can see this does a pretty good job and it creates these bounding boxes of where in the picture things are. So the persons in this area of the picture, well, there's a couple persons, the horse is here, the dog's there. So it's detecting things in that picture and putting bounding boxes around them. The next level up that you can do is actually assign pick what object a pixel belongs to. And that's what this kind of coloring shows. So it's pixel level segmentation. So not only does it say, hey, here's a picture of a person or a traffic light, but it also can draw word and put a bounding box around it. But it can also say these are the pixels that r relate to that person. Here's just a blown up image of it. You can see that not only does it detect the motorcycle, but it detects the person on top of the motorcycle. Pretty impressive categorization. And here is another image of the same thing where it can detect backpacks on the back of people. So it recognizes, hey, these are people, and hey, some of these people have backpacks on them. And CNNs are also used for image like tasks, not just image recognition, but in EEG classification, it's very good. I found this article that was pretty interesting on stereotypical motor movement detection in autism. So all these things that are you can kind of shoehorn into kind of sort of like an image, CNNs would be good at. Even in text classification, they're really pretty much state of the art in text classification. So here, this phrase, no chemistry, regardless of where it occurs, similarly to regardless of where eyes are in a picture, regardless of where the phrase no chemistry, and it sort of means the same when you're doing sentiment analysis. It's not a very positive thing when you say this movie, that the characters in this movie had no chemistry, right? So that was sort of the big picture of what CNNs are. CNNs are layers where you're not looking at the full picture, the full net previous layer, but just a small little patch of it. So let's go into a little bit more detail on this and just more information on that three by three. It doesn't have to be three by three. It's a very common dimension. So that's called a window or a patch. I think I've used these terms already in the talk, but if you hear, hey, what's the window? What's the patch size? think that's the you know the bounding box the little square that we're looking at and three by three and five by fives are pretty much the common sizes here for image classification and here's a question just to get your kind of brain engaged that if the image if we're only looking at a three by three window of the image and that image size is five by five and each three by three patch creates one output What's the dimensions of that output, right? So each, I'm hoping that makes sense. So there's a five by five image. The window is three by three. Each three by three patch creates one output. And what's, what are those dimensions? And so how we would do that is the following. So we have this window 
and that window creates one patch in the next or one node in the next layer and we move that patch or window over and that creates another one in the next layer it outputs and another so that creates three now we move the window down in the original picture that creates one and that creates another and another and we move it down so the answer is is that if we have a five by five image and the patch size is three by three the output is going to be three by three so now the question is what happens if we have that 28 by 28 image and we still have that three by three patch size what are the output dimensions there and if you think about it a bit it would be 26 by 26 and if we have a five by five input patch or sorry if we have a five by five patch on that 28 by 28 image that would be 24 by 24. So we see that the convolutional network kind of shrinks a little bit the original dimensions. If we don't want that, we can always kind of pad around the image. So we can just do a padding. That's, we'd say padding equals same. And that allows us to keep that, those dimensions as we go through. The distance between successive windows is called the stride. So when I showed you before, that one by one by one, that's the stride. We're moving by one. So, right, so when we were going through this image, we started with that window, and then we shift it one, shift it one, and so on. And then we get to the next thing eventually, and it shifts one. So that's the stride. And when, and typically it is one, as I said, when it's not one, it's called a strided convolution. And we can specify what that stride is when we create these layers. Okay, we're going to dive a bit deeper now and look at the dimensions. So we started with a 28 by 28 by 1 when looking at these digits, these images of digits. And the one question you could have is, well, what is that 1? The 28 by 28 makes sense, but what's the 1? And I'm hoping you remember what the one is. It's that grayscale value, right? So it could it range originally in the pictures from 0 to 255. So that was the one. In other pictures, sometimes we get, like in the dog-cat example we're about to start, it's going to be 150 by 150 by 3. And what do you think that 3 is? And if you're thinking that 3 is the red, green, blue value of each pixel in the 150 by 150, you'd be correct. So that's the RGB values. So that dimension is called the depth axis or the channel axis. So we have the 28 by 28 or 150 by 150 axis. The three is kind of the depth or channel axis. So that looks like this. So we have that model add layers, convolu a two-dimensional convolution. And we give it that input shape of 28 by 28 by 1. So now we know what those numbers mean. And the 32 by 3 by 3, we know the 3 by 3 is the patch size or window size. The 32 is the depth or channel axis. So the different channels now, that 32 doesn't stand for colors, but it's really kind of like features or filters. So we're just taking something that's only one deep, that 28 by 28 by 1, and now making it 32 deep. You'll see the reasoning for this shortly. So it sort of looks like this. I, it's kind of a weird picture because it only has the input depth of two, so it's not red, green, blue, <laughs> and it's not just grayscale, but let's go with it. So it has width, height, and input depth, and we're only looking at small sections of that, in this case, the three by three input patches, so we kind of divide that input up into little patches, and we create this transformed, we get some output depth, right? So if we, in this case, we'd say the output channel is three. So we each patch creates one output, one output depth, and then we combine them into that output feature map. Now here's one thing we can start thinking about. So you might think that the number of units in the convolutional layer is equal to the number of patches in the image. So if you had a 150 by 150 image, you zero padding, you'd have these number of units, the 22,500. So, but let's think of how these neural networks work. We're trying, way, way back in the previous lecture, we were talking about 
when, as we're training these neural networks, we're training the weights, the weight factors, the param- what we're calling the parameters. And one question we could ask is, well, how many parameters are there? And let's take a look at our old friend, the dense network. And you can see that first layer was a dense 512, and the input shape was 28 by 28. So that was the image of a number. And when we kind of described it with that model summary, we can see that here that the parameters were 401,920. Now that 401,920 represents how many different weights the network needs to learn. It seems like an awful lot of things that it needs to learn, but that's how many, what the parameters are. How many weights does the thing need to learn? Where do we get that number is the question. You know, where does that 401,920 come from? Well, remember that each pixel is connected to each node of the next network. That's 512. So if we did the math, 28 by 28 times 512, we get 401,408. That's close, but not quite the number of parameters that are shown when we do that model summary. So maybe we're on the right track, but we're not complete. So let's look back even further in our learning of neural networks, and we describe things like this, right? That if we had two inputs, x1 and x2, we have actually three weights. We have that kind of bias weight, that weight zero. So each node has that bias, that one that's not connected to inputs. So if we added those, there were 512 nodes, so each one has its bias term. So if we add that 512 in, that's where we get that 401,920. So there's no mystery there sort of of how we determine that number of parameters. And again, these parameters are the weights that the network has to learn. That's kind of the task of training is to learn all these weights of all the layers, not just that one. Now let's look at this. This is kind of how the patch thing works or the convolutional network works. And we're trying to figure out, well, you know, how many parameters are there in a given layer? So there we have that description of that network. So we have that first layer, 32 by 3 by 3. And that's looking like this, the the output shape. And it says we have 320 parameters. So far fewer than that one previously we showed with the densely connected. That makes sense. But where do we get that 320? So let's examine that. So here we have that patch, that 3 by 3 patch that we defined. And just for the sake of being able to illustrate this a little bit better, let me divide that up so all all the pixels are just in one long column. So there's they are, the 3 by 3 represented in a column. And the 32, remember, was how many channels we have. So I'll draw those there. And remember that each pixel of that 3 by 3 window is connected to each of those 32 channels. So we have the first pixel of that 3 by 3 window connected there, the second one connected there, and so on. So that's where we're getting all those connections. And so the math would be the patch size, right? The 3 by 3 window times how deep the kernel is, in our case 32, and we get 288. Not exactly 320. Where does that difference come in? And the difference is, remember that each of those 1 to 32 also has that bias parameter, so we need to add 32 more in, and that's where we get that 320. So it makes sense, hopefully, of these are the 320 things, these are the parameters of this layer, and these are what we need to learn. So there's no mystery involved. I'm hoping when you start looking at these things, things start making some sense. There's still going to be mystery there. This is an introductory course. We're not going to explain in great detail every tiny aspect of things, but at least we're peeling away these layers of mystery involving neural networks. And again, the question is, what do these kernels do, especially what do these different channels do? And these channels, at least at the initial layer, are determining these hyper features of the picture. Like I showed you before, they're kind of filters. You're filtering the image and creating these different layers. So you can see it does really a pretty good job of kind of edge detection. And you can tell these are 
more or less dog pictures just by looking at any one of those different layers. These are three of the 32 filters I'm showing here. And here are just a few more. And you can see that some are keep pretty much the entire image of the dog and others are pretty good at edge detection. So that was a bit more detailed picture. And finally, let's take a look at that next layer down. And three by three, not exactly. We're going to look at that next layer, that max pooling 2D, two by two layer. As you're looking at convolutional neural nets, it's really common that you alternate these convolutional layers with pooling layers. So it's not the case that you have just convolutional layer after convolutional after convolutional. It's more that these two layers sort of go together. And when we look at that model and do a model summary, we see that there's zero parameters to learn. Well, that's good. <laughs> it doesn't involve a lot of computation on the computer side if we have, don't have to learn anything. All right, so let's check this out. And what max pooling does is it downsamples by a factor of two. And the question you could have is, well, why downsample? Why don't we just do convolutional error, convolutional error, convolutional error? And so it would look sort of like this. There are a couple reasons. One is that, let's say the first layer is a three by three convolution and the second layer is a three by three. So that three by three window in the second layer only contains information from a five by five window. So why is that? Well, this is the first layer progressing, so we have the three by three there in the picture and that accounts for one pixel. There it accounts for another and another. So that three by three window in the second layer only represents that one through five of the first layer. So what's relevant here is that in that second layer, it can only detect an eye in, the fi in a five by five grid up in the top left of the picture and something in the top right is a completely different learning process. So it's key, doesn't really help us in, in this invariant recognition. So it might be difficult to recognize digits if you're only looking at five by five windows. The other problem is that the coefficients, the things, the parameters that it has to learn is huge. So if you flatten at the very end, you usually flatten with a dense layer and you'd have 15 million parameters to train on. That's ridiculous. So two reasons for pooling one is that it's helping us have things non-localized that we can have eyes all over the place. And the other is that it's reducing the number of parameters our model needs to learn. So max pooling is super, super simple. That convolution might be a little bit more interesting to understand. This is ridiculously easy. We just output the max value of each channel. So we look at a two by two part of that layer, and then we see what the max is and we output that and we just slide over, the stride is two. So we look at the next part and we output the max value and then we stride over and we output that one and stride again and output that one. So this is a very simple operation. We just need to find the max of a two by two window and the stride is two. What could be simpler? And that's it. I hope this was helpful. I just wanted to give you kind of a broad overview of convolutional neural nets. Now it's your turn to get into that Jupyter Notebook and give it a try on your own to see if you can build a system that can recognize dogs and cats. So thanks for watching. Take care. See you in the next video.